Hello and welcome back to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar. In this video we're concentrating on the vision of evil as depicted as such a powerful thing across the tragic play Macbeth uh, by William Shakespeare. Not only does it bring the death and destruction and chaos to an entire country as well as entirely ruining the lives of those who embrace it, this evil dominates the play from the first scene and I'd love to get straight into it but before I do I'd love to remind you to hit subscribe and join my tribe for all things English literary and grammatical. So the theme of evil does dominate across this play, but what makes it all the more enchanting and terrifying is the fact that it's depicted as a force which originates from within individuals rather than in the more obvious fiendish witches and their associated spirits. The supernatural does not instigate the evil in the play. Instead, the witches, their agents, of the human beings who are driven by ambition and ruthlessness to commit terrible acts. The dramatic opening scene, although it's brief, immediately immerses us into the atmosphere of evil. We get these crashes of thunder, the peals of lightning and the appearance of the three witches. They're dreadfully ugly. Banquo comments later that they're withered, wild. They look not like the inhabitants of Earth. Yet the witch's hideous appearance perfectly reflects the wickedness of their natures. They chant, fair is foul and foul is fair, hover through the fog and filthy air. And even that rhyme is repulsive and would have presented even more of a striking vision of evil to a deeply religious Jacobean audience than it does to us today. They are inciting evil and foul play. And it's not just the alliteration and the rhyme that do that for us. Shakespeare was well aware of his countrymen's belief and fear of the witches and the supernatural. And he absolutely plays on this from the moment these witches appear and in every appearance they make across the play. Their actions and their trance grow ever more scary and dreadful. The second time they appear, they're placing a curse on a sailor so that he will not be able to sleep anymore and be a man forbid. The third time they appear, they're even more shockingly cruel, adding repellent ingredients such as a finger of birth strangled babe, ditch delivered by a drab, to the disgusting concoction in their cauldron. They lack any sort of morality. These weird sisters are the very embodiment of evil. There is no purpose to their actions, as their chant implies. They want to sow the seeds of pain and death. They want to make what is good or fair foul, and what's foul, fair. They'll not benefit in any way from the destruction of Scotland. Evil, for its own sake, is their only aim. And immediately we're gripped and aware this must have tragic consequences. These opening words from Macbeth link him directly to foul play. He's described in glowing terms by the king and his fellow soldiers, yet we know that he may align himself with the forces of darkness. This is a terrible prospect, especially since the audience has heard details of his savagery and ferocity on the battlefield when he carved out his passage. Macbeth's strength and bravery is an important element to the vision of evil that's depicted in the play. We know that the witch's power is limited. They need an instrument to carry out their grotesque work and Macbeth is the man chosen for the task. And we know that all too well, how he treats those that stand in his way. There's a definite irony to Banquo's description of the witches as instruments of evil. They may be unable to actually effect any lasting evil on the world, yet they have Macbeth in their grip and he becomes their instrument to do the evil they cannot perform. The witches greet him as Thane of Glass, Thane of Cordor and King and each time they startle him into action. They touch a nerve that brings to light the hidden thoughts he cannot address. Banquo asks him, Good sir, why do you start and seem to fear things that do sound so fair? But the reason 
that Macbeth is so startled is that his private desires have come to light. He's wrestling ultimately with his conscience, guys, asking himself if this supernatural soliciting is good or evil. He acknowledges the horror of the evil that's within him when he says in his soliloquy, if good, why do I yield to that suggestion whose horrid image doth unfix my hair and make my seated heart knock at my ribs against the use of nature? We have so many gripping visual images here. The idea that they visually are horrid, that they unsettle him and startle him so that his hair becomes messy, so that his heart is ripping out of itself onto his ribs. It's against nature. He knows it, yet he still falls foul of it. It's significant because these words show us that Macbeth is easily changed. Earlier in the play, Macbeth is described as Valor's minion. A brave man. But now his thoughts are turned to murder. The word minion is cleverly chosen here. On the one hand, it means someone who's highly esteemed, but another meaning is someone who's subordinate, just a follower. And it's fascinating how Macbeth moves from being highly esteemed to just following subordinate orders in a short space of time. From the moment that he is in the thrall of the witch's prophecy, his wife's ambition and his own darkest nature, the shocking aspect of the vision of evil is made all the more clear. Understand it, the witches are really just stirring things up. They're neutral. They don't ask Macbeth to do anything. They just plant the seed. It's he who decides the moral value of the prophecy and decides that it means he should kill the king. Somehow, though, evil in the play is easier to accept if it's entirely the fault of the supernatural. However, it's actually the result of a man being prompted, who up until this point had been a loyal defender of the king and someone whom his wife described as too full of the milk of human kindness that we're forced to face the sobering and grotesque reality that the potential for evil lurks in the heart of even the most outward, outwardly admirable men. Although he gets caught up in evil, we are repeatedly shown Macbeth wrestling with his conscience and his choices. When he says, let not light see my black and deep desires, we recognise the hidden depths of his suffering through the contrast and juxtaposition of light and dark. And we also get the contrast between he and his wife. She has no such qualms. When she reads her husband's letter in Act 1, Scene 5, it's all the more chilling as she begs for evil spirits to unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe top full of direst cruelty. This is a disgusting, appalling devotion to evil. And it definitely is crucial to us unpacking how we see her in a villainous light. When she finds that Macbeth has changed his mind about the murder, Lady Macbeth mocks him. She tells him if she had promised to do this, she would have taken her nursing infant and plucked the nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out. She's unstoppable. But her reference to child abuse is one of many in the play. And it's a potent example of the way in which evil reverses the natural order, removes all that is decent in those who give in to its temptations. It's also the way in which evil takes away hope. Children represent the future. So images of children being killed are even more horrific for us as audience members. 
and their appearances at different moments in the play highlight the amorality that goes along with Macbeth being king. He orders the murder of Fleance, the murder of all of Macduff's family, and the only person we see him kill is the young Seward. The senseless nature of the bloodbath of Macduff's children in particular heightens the notion that evil can consume everything. And juxtaposed against the innocence of children, it's just undeniable. It is a bloodbath under the tyrannous rule of the butcher Macbeth. Scotland weeps, it bleeds. The semantic field of blood is consistently used. People are living in terror. Ross says the inhabitants float upon a wild and violent sea, each way and none. So the villainous way that Macbeth secured the crown is now reflected in the way that he rules. He cannot stop the flood of evil and admits in Act 3, Scene 4, he is in blood stepped in so far that, should I wade no more, returning were as tedious as going over. It feels like a road of no return. And of course, evil can only consume those who choose to embrace it. Lady Macbeth is the first to fall. Almost immediately after the murder of Duncan, her marriage to Macbeth begins to fall apart. Neither he nor she enjoy inner peace again. And we never see them together after Act 3, Scene 4. The drifting apart is one thing, but her life becomes a nightmare and she suffers hellish taunting and torment, haunted by her own evil choices. It's significant when she talks of the Thane of Wife had a wife. Where is she now in Act 5, Scene 1? The Thane of Fife, who had a wife, was obviously Macduff, who Macbeth orders the death of his whole family in Act 4, Scene 2. It's interesting that we are shown her guilt for events that she is not directly in control of. It's also this fragility around married life. It's significant that she's also scared of the dark. Darkness, which she'd earlier called on to hide the actions of her husband and herself and now what she's terrified of and now she has to have the light on at all times. That haunting image of her wandering the halls of a castle in worry driven to take her own life is a horrible indictment of the way evil cannot be controlled or contained by those who have a conscious commitment of doing it. At the end of the play, Macbeth is forced to recognise that gaining power dishonourably brings no reward. He hardly reacts to the news that his wife is dead and instead pontificates on the pointlessness of life, describing it in Act 5, Scene 5 as but a walking shadow and a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. So there's something futile in this. He starts to see the evil lying at the heart of how the witches have used him as their instrument. But it's too late. It's spread depravity and chaos just through fueling his own ambition. He starts to doubt the evil equivocation of the fiend that lies like truth. He might be suspicious but he still believes he can cling on to power and actually he genuinely believes he can't be killed and then Macduff reveals himself and we see that evil turns on those it uses to achieve its aims and has no aim but the spread of chaos and terror and it's not until Macbeth is dead evil can be cast out. Macbeth is a devastating study of evil, showing the impact of it not just on an individual but also on the wider society. But surely to a Jacobean audience well versed in their Bible, there is a definite correlation between Macbeth's relationship with the witches 
and Eve's relationship with temptation through the serpent by tasting the apple. This place serves as a very clear stark warning to anyone who gives in to temptation that nothing good can come from it. So over to you. In the comment section below, I will happily mark across the month of April any response that examines Shakespeare's presentation of evil across the play Macbeth. Good luck and I look forward to hearing what your thoughts are in the comment section below.